I'm going to do on my way home. I'm going to stop and buy a new clock. If that one's not working. It might just be a battery. For the last <laughs> That's crazy. So what time is it really now? 12.45. Whoa, that thing is 15 minutes off. All right, well, I'm not going to penalize you for it. I, I could keep you 15 minutes late, but you didn't do it to me on purpose. So I'll just make up for it. I got that going? Yeah. Page 37. Have to finish up chapter two. How do language and literacy develop? Here's what they say on page 37. By the time they start school, children have mastered most of the rules of language. And their vocabulary consists of thousands of words. I'm thinking by the time they come to school, they do have thousands of words I'm not sure all of them have mastered the rules of language. Huh. No. If their parents didn't, if, they're, if the environment they're living in doesn't use good grammar, they probably aren't going to use it either. And you're going to have to spend some time helping teach them how to speak in a public forum. There's no criticism of the way they talk at home. <laughs> it's just that here in our public forum, we're all going to learn to uh, orate like Roman. You know, our system is built on the uh, Roman system, so we go back to Rome a lot for stuff that we admire. So we'll, we'll learn to be orators like Romans. And I think it's healthy to teach kids why we're learning these rules of grammar because there's, there are conventional ways of speaking that you'll be expected to use mm -hmm. when you go to work, when you apply for a job, when you go to school. So let's just learn how to speak that way. And some of those thousands of words they have will not be <coughs> acceptable <laughs> at school. Mm -hmm. Like when we started this class and I said, so who, what is scope? What's the scope? We were talking about the scope and sequence and somebody mentioned that. And did anyone, the first thing came to your mind when you said scope, was it that thing on a rifle that you used to shoot things? Rather than the um, overview. overview of the chapter of the book? And why did I see the rifle first when I'm the one teaching the class and I know that's where I'm going? Because that's my early life experience. Mm -hmm. And after that I add to it this other scope and so you're going to have to realize these kids will have a lot of words that maybe are the same. You use the same words, but you have different meanings for them. And you have to help them get a handle on that. Page 38 says, Oral language development is heavily influenced by the amount and the quality of the talking parents do with their children. And I think it's a tragedy. But we live in a culture, we live in a world where there's something out there that keeps interfering with parents talking to their children and with children talking to their parents. What's out there that's interfering with it? Technology. And what kind of interference are we getting from technology? Not positive. Father comes home from work. Son comes home from school. Father and son sit down and talk about the day. What went on? No. Son's playing what? On his Video phone games. Or... And father is... Watching TV. Watching TV. And they're both very comfortable. But they're not, de they're not doing what needs to be done to help this child develop his linguistic literacy so somewhere when they get to school you have to try to start making up for for what hasn't happened before and how do you go about doing that now did did some of you have homes where you came home and you girls would 
sit down and have a talk with your mother and she would fix you some milk and cookies and you would talk about all that happened at school and she would talk about her day. Mm -hmm. You had one I, of those? Yeah. I was homeschooled, so yep. my mom sat with me to do my homework all day. <laughs> did she talk to you about it or did she just watch you do your homework while she was sewing or reading or doing something else? Um, I would work on my homework and then she would come and we would talk through the answers together. And then after you got your homework done, you guys would just visit about everyday stuff? Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, it happened to you? No? Yes? No? Yes? Well, there you go. If you've had some of that, then you're going to, probably doing it is going to be a little easier. If you haven't had that, it's going to be a little awkward engaging your students in conversations. Just like, uh, okay, Carissa, you said no about that interaction. So you're sitting there eating while ago, and I'm asking Anna Lee, where did you get the name Anna Lee? Mm -hmm. Now, were you sitting there thinking, why is he asking something like that? A little. <laughs> yeah. well, or were you just as curious as I was about how I'm she got her name? Curious. What? <laughs> you were probably more curious. More curious. You probably were, yeah. Okay, but see, that's where you see sometimes if if something if we're not used to something, seeing it done will seem a little strange. Yeah. Doing it ourselves will seem a little strange. And what I concluded years ago is if God had called me to be a teacher, I was going to read the books and be the best teacher I could be. And if that meant it made me a different person than I was growing up, that's okay. And now it's changed me so much that when I go to Oklahoma and get together with my relatives, mm -hmm. we just start carrying on a conversation, just about anything, and if it happens to be something I've read about or researched as a teacher, I lean forward at the table and I get animated and I start talking about it and my sister gets all bent out of shape. <laughs> and she goes, don't talk to me in your teacher voice, Tom. I'm not one of your students. Whoa. <laughs> and I thought, aha, I've changed so much as a person that she was used to interacting with a different person. Well, I don't, I don't care. I don't know. I don't care. What are the two biggest problems in the world? I don't know, and I don't care. And then someone says, apathy and ignorance. Yep. So what does that do to anything? You're both. Both what? Ignorant and apathetic. Okay. Anything else? It's just like, what? You, are you thinking about this conversation? Oh, uh, not really. I'm just being sociable and engaging in a conversation with my sisters. And my wife says sometimes that you don't engage enough in conversations with your sisters. I'm going, they were so young when I left. It's so difficult. She goes, if you can do it with all these other people in life, you can do it with them. Were you inquisitive as a child? Like, did you always... I was always curious about everything. It got me in so much trouble. <laughs> Curiosity, what does that say? Killed Curiosity does killed what? Killed the cat. See, and I didn't care because we didn't have any cats and I didn't like them anyway. So I didn't <laughs> and, and, I, and I remember thinking, I'm smarter than a cat. You're not going to mess with me. I just was curious about everything. Hmm. Everything in life. I just wanted to know what, how things worked, what was going on. And I was always trying stuff that I shouldn't have been trying because I didn't know what I was doing exactly and I was making a mess of things. And I'd get in trouble for it and then I'd feel bad. And some of it, I can still remember how bad I felt. Mm. But I just kept doing it. <laughs> I just had a need to know, this drive inwardly to find things out, to check stuff out. That's what I love about this computer age. You want to know something about anything? Just what? Google it. And you can find out something about it. It's amazing what you can do out there. So just realize, some of these kids are going to bring some words that you're going to tell them they have to leave them at home. And, by the way, 
Lot, some words are good words, some words are bad words. You'll have to help them sort out what's what. And do all of you know the three magic words in life? Were you taught what are the three magic words? Please. Please. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. That's a good one, too. That makes four enough. of them. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. May I please and thank you. Those were the three magic hmm. words at our house. Hmm. I'm sorry. You really are sorry. I mean, you do something wrong. You mess up and you're sorry. You better be sorry for messing up. No, 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 no. That's one of the magic words is to say, I'm sorry. Oh, I'd rather you just say, I messed up, didn't I? I was wrong. What did you do? See, I have a theory about this, confessing sin. To say I'm sorry doesn't really confess it. To confess it says to say what God says about it. <laughs> so instead of saying, Nina, I'm sorry, I go, Nina, I talked mean to you, and that was wrong. That is so much more meaningful, isn't it? And it's so much ther more therapeutic for the person who's doing the confessing, too. Say, sorry, sorry, sorry. And I want to say, you know, you really are sorry. <laughs> no, that because I'm kind of a caustic personality, and I have to watch that, that it doesn't come through any more than it does. But may I please and thank you, and you're welcome, and all those kind of things. You're going to have to teach kids how to say those magic words. Page 38, oral language develops. Oh, I did that one already. So page 39, promoting literacy. How are you going to promote literacy? What are you going to do to promote literacy? I think you do it even in this classroom, just talking about stuff that you've learned and researched. Like, I don't think I've ever met a professor that was so vocal about the stuff that they've been, like, learning and researching and just being very open and... With the, with the hopefully, the intent that, what, you say, I want to know something? I want to do that, yeah. I'll go, f I'll go look stuff up. I'll go find something. Just increasing a, encouraging a love of learning. I walked into a classroom one time and found out that I said, so how many of you have a library card? Because I was going to have them go to the library and check out a book. Can you believe that? I was in a room full of people who didn't have a library card. And this was back before computers, mm -hmm. where if you didn't have a library card, the only books you had access to were the ones that were in your house. And I said, this is, this is wrong. I just looked at them. I said, this is wrong. And they go, what? I'm going, we have to have library cards and check out books. So I got, I said, we're going on a field trip. Any idea where we went on our field trip? <laughs> to the library. Any idea what we did at the field trip? Learned how to check out books. They all got a library card and had to check out a book. And I got some phone calls from parents saying, thank you for teaching my child how to check out a book. It's like, who's going to pay for this book if he loses it? I go, well, I guess you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, why'd you let him check this out? It's got a due date in it. How's he going to get it back to the library? I wanted to say, you get in your car. Mm. You put him next in the car with you. You drive him to the library and let him turn the book back in. But that seemed to be an unreasonable request in the minds of some of these parents. Mm -hmm. Now, I can't change that, but I said, have him bring the book to school, and I'll take it back and check it back in the library for him. Now, some of these kids, what, they checked out a book, and then they read it because it was a requirement, because I'm trying to do what? Promote literacy. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm trying to do. I want them to have a library card and read books. And so I'm going to do what it takes to get that started. But do you think any of those students who never had a library card before said, wow, this is so cool to go into the library and see all these books and know that I can check out any of them? Sure. Whether they admitted it or not, I'm sure that a lot of them were impressed and... Either and they were lying to themselves or they were impressed and wanted to come back. Like, and <laughs> and because it's just like, I don't care what you say. You find a book that has useful information. You find something you're interested in. You check out a book and read about it. All of a sudden, you feel more powerful than mm -hmm. you did the day before. Mm -hmm. Books just do that for us. They enrich our lives. Now, today, reading does that for you. But you can go to the Internet and do all that reading. Mm -hmm. So... In a sense, what are you going to do to promote literacy? You probably won't take them to the library and get a library card. 
Now you might, but you say, what I really want them to do is learn how to go to the internet and find useful information and read it. Teach a computer class on how to do research. What? Teach a computer class on how to do research. Teach the kids in your class, if, if no matter what I'm teaching, if they don't know how to do research on the internet, I'm going to show them how to do it, walk them through the process, and get them started. I, ca I call it, this is an old farm term, I call it priming the pump. Yeah. Have you ever had a pump where you pour water in it and then the, the little leather sleeves that pump the water out of the ground mm -hmm. are dry so you pour water in it and then you start pumping it and it gets the leather wet so then it catches on the sides and mm -hmm. it sucks the water up and, and it's like my theory is that if I prime the pump with these kids and they get a taste of that water mm -hmm. they'll go back on their own and get some more. So I'm just going to do things that promote literacy. Uh, did any of you have people read books to you when you were younger? My mom was a literary, speci literary specialist at a library, so I okay. lived in a library. Did you guys have anybody read books to you? Did all of you have people reading books to you? Mm -hmm. How did it feel? Do you have fond memories of it, or was oh. it such a drudgery? So much. Fond memories? Yes. What made it so much fun? Someone wanted to spend time with you. Yeah. It's like they're talking to you, isn't it? Remember when I said, this textbook is so cool? It's like this guy's just talking to us. It's like we're sitting here reading his lectures. And it's just like it's, we're spending time together. Anybody, what were some other things that you remember about the time that people read to you? My, I, have a, well, I have two little sisters, one that's just a year younger than me and then one that's seven years younger than me. And when the one that's seven years younger than me came along and got the age when mom was reading to her like regularly and she'd be able to understand and connect with the story, Rain and I, my other younger sister, we would sit behind the couch so that mom didn't know we were listening to the story. <laughs> but we would sit there because we remembered her doing it. She would come in on Sunday afternoons for the Sunday afternoon housewide nap. And she'd come into our room and read us a book. And then it was nap time. And so, I mean, mom always read to us. And then we'd have the end of the night devotions as a family where we'd read like a keys for kids type story. Mm -hmm. And so, and she's instilled that in all of us. There's seven kids in my family and we all love to read, which I think is just crazy. I love it. It's all, so cool. See, and I, and I think, are you gonna have kids in your classroom that haven't had an experience like that? Mm -hmm. And haven't had anybody read to them at all? So the first time they're gonna hear an adult read to them will be when you pick up a book. Mm -hmm. And, and, and what's one part of it reading is it's like we're having an interaction, conversation together. The other part of it, <laughs> do you like reading books and being animated about it? Oh, that's what my mom did. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's just like <laughs> you start reading that book and you get into it. Uh, scary part. What is that? The Herdman's Christmas? You don't know about the Herdman's. The Herdman family at Christmas. <laughs> Every Christmas, we used to pull this book out and read about this family of delinquents <laughs> who came to church and wanted to be in the church play Christmas pageant. I, it might be called the, the best Christmas pageant ever. And we would sit around the room every Christmas and pass the book around and take turns reading pages until you couldn't read anymore because you were laughing so hard <laughs> and you had to pass the book on to the next person. And it's just like, this is so cool. And, and that kind of animated reading yeah. gives people an appetite for it. Yeah. So you promote it by just reading to the children. It's one thing they say on page 39. And then you surround them with books. Mm -hmm. You find, did you know there's a place on the internet where you can find little stories where kids can pick the kind of stories they want to read and they can read them on the internet? When you take your course on how to teach reading, you'll probably come in contact with that kind of source. Mm -hmm. That those There's some excellent sources out there where there's, where you, you let kids read about stuff they're interested in. Mm -hmm. Don't say, I want all of you to read this story so we can discuss that story. 
I mean, that's neat when you can do that, but I mean, you can do it once in a while, but don't make that all of your reading. In other words, it's more work to teach reading where you let each kid choose his own story. But what's cool about that, watch what can happen. If each kid chose a different book based on their interest and read the book and then took turns, remember, we're talking about promoting literacy here. So that means reading and speaking and writing, all of those. So then you have the kid tell the story of the book, and while he's telling the story, you have all the people with their pencils writing down the rough draft of their version of the story. You, you follow me? So, what would your story be about, Matt? If you had got to pick your own book. Oh, it'd be some like action filled book. And what kind of action? Uh guys whacking each other's heads off and blood spurting out. <laughs> uh, I mean, if that's it, that's okay with me. <laughs> and you go, gross. Greek hey, fighting. if that's, what? Greek fighting. Greek fighting, sword fighting. So he's got these guys sword fighting, whacking each other's heads off, whacking their arms off, cutting their legs off, and they're all bouncing around, bleeding, squirting blood everywhere. And they see, when he tells his story, he's gross and you gross out. And it's like, okay, I get the picture here. And, I, and when I write my version of his story, I'm going to clean it up a little bit, right? I'm going to take out all the gore and say, it was awful gory, but he was fighting for her honor. He was trying to protect her life. He was hoping to save her from the terrible people, the pirates. You understand? See, it's like, do I have a vivid imagination or what? <laughs> but can, can you see what you do? That while he's telling his story, they're taking notes on how they're going to write their own version of his story. They're going to take his story and use it as kind of a stepping stone to write another story. So now I've got everybody telling a different story. And what's going to happen is Matt's going to take all of your stories and turn them into sword whacking, chopping off head stories. You know, it's just like, and now maybe not all of them, Matt, but it's like he'll have plenty of them that way. And I'm thinking if that's where he is, and I'm trying to teach, I'm trying to promote literacy, then I'm going to let him do that kind of stuff. I'm going to try to stretch him beyond it, but I'm going to go right where he's living to get him to do reading and writing and speaking. And if you do that, once, once that happens and you get those little kids to uh, sprout, <laughs> to pop out of their little shells, maybe like popcorn, you get it going and it's like, whoa. And don't be surprised if some of those little kids end up saying, I think I could write a novel. Hmm. I'm saying, go ahead, do it. And don't be surprised if some of your little cherubs end up writing something that gets published somewhere. Mm -hmm. Find out where you can go to get things published. It might even be that when they write stories, you, in fact, you could kind of, if you want to do a group thing, you could take some kind of group setting where, uh, like a takeoff on Little House on the Prairie, where everybody writes a different chapter for a different facet of life on the prairie. And then you put it all together, everybody's chapter goes into a book, and you get the book printed, and it shows all the class members as authors of the book. Mm. I tell you what, when little kids see their name in print, yeah. okay, just, just to diverge a little bit from this thing about literacy, okay, what's one of the most objectionable parts of mathematics? Is it problem solving? Teaching, having little kids work problems in math? They just don't, they, I mean, they just don't see how the problems relate to life. Mm -hmm. So I decided to try something one time. I said, I can't change all the problems because I need the numbers in here to make it work. But what if instead of a little boy uh, went to the store and bought some pencils, if I just changed the problem, if I just took the problem out of the book and typed it up on a piece of paper, and I said, Seth went to the store to buy some pencils. 
And when he picked out the pencils he wanted to buy, he went to the checkout counter, and Clarissa said, you'll have to pay me this much money for the pencils. All I did was take the problems out of the book and insert the student's name, and they had a whole different attitude about doing math problems. They even said, this is kind of cool. And they didn't, I don't think they even realized they were doing the same problems in the book, but it had their name in it. And then one of the guys said, Mr. Bowman, why isn't my name in, the, in, in one of the story problems? I said, you give me too much grief. <laughs> misbehave and mess around and just make my life miserable. I said, straighten up and fly right and do the right thing and I'll start putting your name in a problem. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> And I thought, praise the Lord, I found something that motivated this little squirrel to get out of his tree and do something with life. And I think sometimes you say, I'll just try something and see what happens. Now, some of you are too kind to do something like that. But see, I'm just caustic enough to say, hey, that's just the way life is. You make my life uncomfortable, I'll just leave you out of the story. Okay, enough of that. Let's get back to teaching literacy. Surround them with books. That means you're going to have books everywhere. You're going to have books for them to pick up and read when they have a spare moment. You're going to have book, and, and they're going to say, can I take this book home? And it's one of your favorite books. And what are you going to want to say? Oh. No, leave it here in the classroom so it won't go home and get damaged. But what do you say because you're trying to promote literacy? Yep. Like, yep, so take it, it home. Tomorrow. And you know what? If you let them take the book home and it gets destroyed at their house because their father used it to start a fire because <laughs> he just didn't know it was a book that the kid got from school. Why is he bringing school books home anyway? Found some paper to start a fire. Don't be surprised if the next time you go to the thrift store and you're looking at the books for 25 cents, you find your book on the shelf and you buy it and take it home and say, there you go, the Lord took care of that. Encourage reading and writing and speaking. And one thing I like from the, I picked up from the textbook on page 39 is this coaching them to be better readers. Like saying, you know, point at the words. Don't, don't point at the letters. And let's sound those things out. In other words, walk kids who have difficulty reading through the process. Because if you don't teach those little cherubs how to read, you know what all the literature says? They're going to start to fall behind in school and they're going to join the crowd called delinquent. And I tell you what, it costs a lot more to keep children incarcerated mm. because they become delinquents than it does to give them an education and teach them how to avoid that stage of life. Give them something more to live for, something worth, worth doing. So coach them. And if, if it means, I know this, uh, they, if it means staying after school because this child needs some extra help, then stay after school and help them. If it means coming early to school and giving them the extra help. Actually, here's what I discovered. I didn't ask the students if they wanted to stay after school for help. When they needed the help, I just said, I want you to stay after school for help. And I would keep them for like 30 minutes after school. And their parents would sit in the parking lot and wait 30 minutes for them or come 30 minutes later to pick them up. And all of a sudden, now most of my teaching was math. So all of a sudden, the kid who wasn't paying attention in math, now that he's stayed after school for 30 minutes, two days at school, now I noticed he's being more attentive in math class. What's going on here? Guess what he perceives as my help keeping him after school for 30 minutes. Punishment? It's exactly what he thinks. He thinks I'm punishing him. And I'm not. I'm helping him learn how to do math so he can be competent enough in math. I mean, the two skills that you need to be successful in this world are literacy skills and math skills. So I'm going to help him become competent in his math skills. But since he sees it as punishment, he wants to get out of this deal. So he figures out if I start learning it in school and get it done. So he says, if I get this done, will I have to stay after school tonight? And I smile and say, no, you can go on home if you've got it figured out. And all of a sudden, I found another kid that, bing, he starts learning. Mm -hmm. He starts developing 
number literacy, mathematical literacy that it needs. So I'm just saying, be willing to say, I'm going to help this child because where they will go if they don't get this is a place I don't want any child going. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to do all I can to help those kids get, uh, get the skills they need. And they need literacy skills and verbal skills and writing skills and help them get all three. So, have you had your teaching reading course yet? Anyone taken your course on teaching We're reading? You have? <laughs> so you know all about uh, Isn't that what phonemic awareness? No, We're in the class right now. Oh, you're in the class. So have you talked yet about phonemes? The sounds we all make, that we put the sounds together and make words? Mm -hmm. yeah. And you want the kids to become aware of those? Have you talked about phonics? Mm-hmm. Where you learn to read by, okay, what sound does the letter A make? Ha. Ha, like in hat. Any other sounds? A. A. Ah, like in car. Ah, ah. Okay, those are the sounds that, that the letter A stands for. When I was in college here, the state of Illinois, embarked on a brand new reading program called Sight Reading and phonics was thrown out the door. The new science of reading says everyone should learn to read sight reading. One of my friends in school here was from Illinois. So he had taught, he'd been taught reading with sight reading which meant he couldn't figure out some of the stuff he was reading in college. He graduates from college, he goes to Brazil to be a missionary and he learns Portuguese, and they teach Portuguese phonetically. Mm -hmm. He goes, that's the way I should have learned English. Mm -hmm. So he goes back and teaches himself phonetic English, so he can teach his children English in a way that he wasn't taught. And really, it makes him want to sue the state of Illinois <laughs> for messing with him. And mm -hmm. what's happened since then? The sight reading people, now we still do some of that. What, what's it called in your books now? Uh, what is it? It's in there. I guess the, the author talks about comprehension and vocabulary. Maybe that's it. You just learn these words and how to say them in vocabulary. But now it's a mixture of both because the people who taught sight reading only said that was a disaster. Mm -hmm. We should have kept some phonics in there. And just watch out, when people come along and they're making these drastic changes, there was a drastic change made in teaching mathematics. Watch this. Children are just naturally mathematical. No. So you don't have to give them answers in the book. You just ask the right questions and they will naturally think the right mathematical concepts. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> that is the dumbest thing I ever heard of. <laughs> And I had to take a whole math series of textbooks and go through them and have the kids write the answers to the questions so the next person who read the book would know what the truth was about math. Because your mathematical abilities were damaged at the fall just like your spiritual and moral capacities were damaged mm -hmm. and your linguistic capacity. Think about it. If we still lived in the Garden of Eden, there'd be no cuss words. Wouldn't need them. Wouldn't have them. They wouldn't be a part of our vocabulary. Well, never that. Okay. So, uh, so you want to make sure you're teaching these kids all this stuff, and you're getting a, taking a couple of classes to do that. So, what does page 41 and 42 say the intentional teacher does? The intentional teacher is aware of what students can do. I watch my students to see what they can do, and I know what to do next to take them from where they are to where I want them to be. I mean, so if you say, well, they don't know this. Well, then if there's a whole bunch of words in our reading material that, th that isn't a part of their vocabulary, then let's put it in our vocab words and make it part of what we're teaching them. Let's modify that. Let's make the list longer if we're trying to catch up and get this stuff done. We assess the thinking process. How do you assess the thinking process? You can test them. You can have them 
read a book back mm-hmm. to you. Mm-hmm. They can read it, then they can read it. If they can't, Here's they a little kid reading a book. Mary went to the store. And I go, where did Mary go? He goes, what? Mm-hmm. Why is he saying what? Because he wasn't processing what he was reading. Mm-hmm. He read all the words, <coughs> but his, and the, and the textbook talks about his, his fluency, his speed of reading is so slow, he's not connecting the words together, so he can't answer the question. So when somebody's, at the, when I'm helping these kids develop their reading skills, then when they read something, I say, What did she just say? Or what just happened? And if they're just running the words through their heads and out their mouth and not thinking about it, then I catch them doing that and they go, I don't know, I was just reading. I'm going, oh no, you you were just making noise. They go, what? Yeah, I mean, isn't that, if you just say those words and make noise, but you don't connect the words together to know what they were talking about, you don't have any meaning yet. There's no comprehension going on here. So you start asking questions about when they're reading stuff. What did you just read? What did they just say? And even to the point to where, what are you thinking? I mean, they're reading something in a story. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put, what? Humpty together again? Who is this Humpty Dumpty? And how could horses put a Humpty Dumpty together, whatever he is? <laughs> See, and, and I'm going to say, so what do you think about that? And they go, who's Humpty Dumpty? And is it who is Humpty Dumpty or what is Humpty Dumpty? You don't have a picture in your mind of Humpty Dumpty? I have the egg that was always in like this. this it, was it always an egg in your books? Yeah. yeah. You know what it was in early England when that little ditty was written? Hmm. <laughs> I think well, I'm go to the internet and find out. No, you have to tell us. Okay, if you go around making insults to the, of the king and the queen, <laughs> your head rolls so instead people who wanted to be critical of the government made up little riddles and That's passed them awesome. around like crazy That's so funny. and for some reason we decided to make them part of education in America because <laughs> we didn't like the government either <laughs> who knows what that's all about I mean literature is a okay here you're talking to a guy who loves math okay and I don't care much for reading but literature is so exciting, isn't it? I mean, just reading to be reading. I was talking to my granddaughter the other day about when she was in school here, she was talking about some story she had to read in high school. And I said, I just saw that on public television, the movie of it, it looked pretty interesting. She goes, well, the book was boring. I said, well, I think I'll buy it on my Kindle and read it. And I bought it. Ah, wear me out. What book was it? Great Expectations. Um, I never read that actually. Picture book. That guy needs to get a life. Along with a whole bunch of other people in that story, don't they? Mm-hmm. This is just and so much of the book is all this stuff he's talking about going on in his head. How do you put that in a movie somewhere? Mm. And it's just like, boy, I'm not going to read that book again. But I'm not going to quit reading. In fact, are you ready for this? Could it be that the teachers in our schools have given children a distaste for literacy because they've made them read books that aren't any fun to read? Mm -hmm. Yes. For sure. And somehow, I'm thinking, we have to help kids connect with where they have an interest. You want to skin a cat? Go to the internet and find out how to skin one. Oh my word. <laughs> Gross. Well, okay, you don't go there. 
You want to know how to field dress a rabbit? You say, why would you want to know that? So you can take it to the house and let somebody cook it. You say, I'm not eating rabbit. Okay, what about squirrel? Yep, did that too. <laughs> My grandson shot a squirrel and said he cooked it. He roasted it and was passing a little piece of it around and I ate some of it. And I said, now I know why they put the recipe for squirrel in the... The Missouri has a conservation department. It has a magazine. Do any of you get that magazine mm -hmm. with all those beautiful pictures in it? It's free. You ought to be getting it. And you ought to have it at school in your classroom for kids to look at it. But it had a recipe for squirrel. But the recipe was like 15 different spices. And then squirrel meat. You probably could have taken those 15 spices and put cardboard in there. And it would have tasted the same. In other words, they're just camouflaging the taste of the squirrel with all those spices. Because apparently the squirrel by itself doesn't have much going for it. And the part I tasted didn't. But I ate it because my grandson said he shot it and he roasted it. And I said, well, give me a piece of that. Let me see what it tastes like. Hey, I mean, what am I going to do? Say, I'm not eating that ugly stuff. Encourage kids to do things. And encourage kids to find things. Encourage kids to do some research in areas where they have an interest because I want to promote literacy. Okay, uh, understand levels of thinking. If I know this is where they're thinking and this is where I want them to be, how can I move them down the thinking trail to where they become a little more sophisticated? And uh, modify instructions to challenge them and to help those who are struggling. Some kids need to be challenged to push on harder. Others, you need to help them get caught up. I think it's sad that some children, for some reason, they get sick or something happens, they miss out on some school, they get behind, they stay behind for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. Why didn't somebody say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna catch you up. I'm gonna take time to help you get caught up. And uh, diversify peer interaction. Don't have them always interact with the same peers. Mm -hmm. Provide problem-solving activities, real problems that they can work with. My granddaughter did a cool thing. Those little kids that you went to the Museum of Science Industry with, some of you went with them. Okay, she's having them study uh, building their own business. And apparently they're all going to be selling fudge or something. So I get an email. It says, we're doing a... Uh, a marketing survey, five kinds of fudge. Which kind would you be interested in buying? Peanut butter. Which are your favorite kind of fudge? Peanut butter. And okay, that was one of the choices. So you would have checked peanut butter. I checked milk chocolate. Somebody, anybody would check uh, fudge with nuts in it? Okay. So anyway, I check it off, and I'm thinking, that's a cool idea to give these little kids a chance to to survey the market to see what kind to make. As soon as I checked it off and clicked send, my next thought was, <laughs> uh, today at three o'clock, I better run down to her little school and buy some of that fudge since I told them I like milk chocolate. Now, it was a marketing survey, but what else was it? Advertisement. A marketing strategy mm -hmm. to get people to come in and feel like they, I'm compelled to buy the chocolate. Mm -hmm. That's good business in America. And I think that's what you say. Okay, I'm going to provide my kids with activities, problem-solving activities that can be meaningful to them at their age level and that um, can teach them something about solving their kind of problems in life, not the adult world's problems in life. Uh, account for culture, family, community, and work with parents. Now, uh, some years ago, I taught in the middle school in the inner city. At we I, I taught at Westport Middle School uh, in the inner city. Taught junior high math or middle school math. And uh, here's what all of my peer teachers said to me. That parents don't come in for parent-teacher conferences because the parents here in the inner city just don't care. And I just simply said, I don't believe that. I think people who have children care about their children's welfare. And I happen to believe that people who live in the inner city and have a, a dead-end job and a dead-end house and a dead-end life mm -hmm. want something better for their children. Mm -hmm. 
So I asked the office if they had the telephone numbers for parents so I could call parents and get them involved in helping their children with homework or just making sure they get to school on time. And they didn't have, they said, well, we've got the phone numbers on file, but we don't do anything with them. So I had to go through all the files and pull out all the kids' home num phone numbers. Then I started calling parents and asking them, saying, your, ch your child didn't do this homework. Did you know they had this to do? Uh, you know, and no. Well, I said, can you kind of ask them when they come home? Sure, I'll be glad to do that. And I found the parents were very cooperative mm -hmm. because they wanted their kids to get an education. And, and I'm saying, if you have people telling you, no, those parents don't care, I'm thinking... Parents care more than we let on. Sometimes they just don't let teachers know they care. And sometimes teachers can become very critical of parents because parents are very critical of teachers. And so all of a sudden we get this, you know, I'll criticize you, you criticize me, and nobody gains from that. Mm -hmm. In my mind, the best thing I can do to work with parents is when a kid complains about his parents, I'm, I'm going to take the side of the parent. They go, you know what my dad said? You know what my mom did? And they go, what do you think about that, Mr. Bowline? I said, well, you know, I've got you in class, so I kind of know a little bit about the way you operate. He goes, what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm thinking if I had to live with you 24 hours on a weekend, I'd probably get a little bit out of shape, too, with some of the stuff you do. What? <laughs> Because you know what he's looking for. He's looking for someone to take his side. And I just don't think that's beneficial. I think I can take the parent's side most of the time. Yeah. One guy even said to me, he said, well, he said, I get in trouble here at school for doing this, but my dad does it all the time. What about that? And I just looked him right in the eye and I said, you know something? Here's the deal, Frank. Your dad pays a lot of money for you to come to this school because he wants you to learn something that he never learned in school. Because he doesn't like himself when he behaves like that. And I knew the guy. And I knew it bothered him when he blew his stack like that. And I said, and he wants you to learn better. Hmm. So let's give him something for his money and get to work and learn what he brought you here to learn. I mean, and hopefully you'll grow up and, and be able to be a, the man that he wishes he could be. And you're not helping the situation by adding to his grief, by pointing out to him when he gets uh, all worked up about something. Because you're supposed to honor your parents. Okay. Looks like we're done with that chapter. So let's move on to the next one. Chapter 3. Page 45. Developing self-concepts ways of interacting with others, and attitudes toward the world. Does that sum up social, <laughs> moral, and emotional development? Developing self-concepts, ways of interacting with others, and attitudes toward the world. So how's your self-concept? You say, well, what is my self-concept? It's your concept of who you are. Mm. And how are you, do you interact with others? You like the math involved here? God gave me one mouth and two ears. So I should listen twice as much as I talk. Proverbs even says something about the more you talk, <laughs> the more you sin. And I smile when I hear that because I earn my living Talking. being a motor mouth. <laughs> and that's pretty scary. Wow. So, do I listen more than I talk to others? And here again, I think it's part of our culture. We don't often listen to each other in our society. You can just you could sit in the cafeteria and observe conversations at a table, and often what you'll see is people take turns talking to each other. In other words, while you're talking, I'm thinking of what I'm going to say when you stop mm -hmm. talking, mm -hmm. and as soon as you stop talking, I say what I want to say, and you're not listening to me. You're thinking about what you're going to say as soon as I stop talking. Mm -hmm. And that's not a conversation. 
And I happen to think that we have some modern technology in our society that contributes to the demise of conversation. Yeah. It's called television. You walk in the house and, and video games. You walk in the house and someone's doing something, you want to carry on a conversation, and they keep doing what they're doing and listen to you at the same time, but they're not really conversing with you. Mm -hmm. And doesn't it make a big difference? It's when someone stops what they're doing and gives you their undivided attention. Mm -hmm. And you know one of the little techniques, there's techniques for doing this kind of stuff. One of these techniques to improve interacting with others is when you say something to me, if I really want to promote conversation, I will say, did I just hear you say da 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 And you go, yes. You go, well, then here's what I think about that. You, you follow? If I repeat back to you what you said before I go ahead and say something, then that kind of ensures that I'm listening. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I repeated it back to you has your attention because now I'm tuned into what you were saying. And then, if, and, and quite frequently what will happen is, did I just hear you say da 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 And you say, no, I didn't say that. Mm -hmm. Oh, what did you say? And so then you say it again, and now I'm listening more intently. So, so basically what's going on is you're going to have to teach these kids how to carry on conversations with each other. You're, and you can get on the internet and do research and say, what are some of the tricks, what are some of the techniques I can use to have kids engage in meaningful conversations? How can I help them interact with others in positive ways? And what kind of attitudes do we have about the world today? Everybody in Washington is so critical and negative and hateful. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Well, I sure don't want to be a politician, not in that kind of environment. But is everybody up there mean and hateful? Or is it just the mean and hateful people that are getting all the publicity? Mm. Didn't we have an elected representative come here and speak in the yeah. chapel at, in an Last assembly? Year. Who was it? Was, was it Jim? Jim something random? Was it Vicki Hartzler? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. who's Vicki Hartzler? Anyone know who Vicki Hartzler is? Mm -hmm. She's from she's state representative from Missouri, isn't she? She's our elected representative. She serves in Washington in the House of Representatives. Does she sound does she sound like a hateful person? No. That's probably why the media never quotes her. There's <laughs> nothing to quote. Because all they're looking for is the mean hateful stuff that people say to each other. So maybe our attitude toward the world out there is being more influenced by a few narrow-minded media people who have an agenda who want to do what? Stir the pot. To drive us away from being involved. If only 10% of the people were to elect the people who are in power to make decisions, it'd be easier to focus on getting those 10% to vote for you rather than having a whole bunch of, instead of having 300 million people voting, you only have 30 million voting, let's target those 30 million to get them to vote our way. <laughs> we could buy those 30 million votes with mm -hmm. what they spend on advertising today. You say, well that would be illegal. Well yeah, there'd probably be some way to get around it. Nah. I mean, do you understand? It's just kind of ugly and terrible what's going on. And what's my attitude? And my attitude is that, yes, there's a lot of ugliness in Washington, but it's not all ugliness. It's just that the media is only presenting the ugliness, mm -hmm. as my wife says, because it helps the ratings. They get more listeners when they report ugly stuff yep. than when they, just like, I asked this one time years ago, why do news channels report only bad news? Why don't we say, there's no reason to talk about the ugly stuff that goes on, let's go through town and find all the people doing good things and let's report that on the news. Mm. All the people who helped somebody whose car broke down, all the people who did something, you understand? There's enough good stuff going on where we could report that. No, nope, we would rather talk about ugly stuff, about bad stuff, about mean and terrible stuff. So I'm thinking my attitude toward the world 
should not be affected primarily by the media, which means maybe I quit listening to them, or if I'm going to listen to them, I like to take four or five media sources and look at all of them to see what they have in common and see what one person reported that nobody else did. And it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing what's going on out there. And then I think, yeah, but from God's perspective, what should be my attitude toward the world? Well, what's God's attitude toward the world? He loves them. No matter how bad they are? Mm -hmm. Boy, I think of, what, what did Jesus say when he was dying for our sin? Yeah. You know not what you do. And I thought, we really do live in a world, don't we? Of people who do a lot of ugly things and they have no idea what they're doing. They're not even aware of what's going on. And praise the Lord that we've got some inside information that gives us uh, hope that the rest of the world doesn't know anything about. Page 46 talks about Erickson's eight stages of development. And you can either look at the positive side of those stages or the negative side. And here's what I say. If I emphasize the positive side, I won't have to worry about the negative side. And what's the first one on the list? Trust. Now, every little kid, and Erickson says they ought to learn that from zero to two. I'm sorry, but you're going to have kids who have come to school who still haven't learned how to trust people mm -hmm. because something's gone wrong earlier in their life and they haven't figured it out. So it's just like, and how will I know that they don't trust people? Because I can tell the way they react. So guess what? I'm going to become the first person in their life that they can trust. I'm going to become a trustworthy person. Mm -hmm. And is it possible, this is what I want to ask, is it possible for a child to go through six years of having life experiences where you can't trust anybody and meet one teacher that they can trust for one year and they can all of a sudden start to develop this capacity for trust in their life? They just won't trust as many people because of their past experience. Mm -hmm. But can I teach them that particular skill mm -hmm. of learning to trust people? And if they have one person they can trust, and of course, who's the person that all of us can trust? Mm -hmm. God. That's exactly right. So somehow we have to figure out a way to encourage those kids to go visit Good News Club and see what that good news is all about. And uh, go to church and see what's going on. Is there a church close to your house? Go check it out sometime just to see what there's... I wonder if we'd get in trouble in school if we gave all the students an assignment to go visit a church and write a report on what they learned there. I don't know. That would be interesting. That's no different than having them watch a movie and write a report, is it? Yeah. Or going to the science and industry and writing a report. I'm not telling them where to go. I'm just saying write a report about that kind of stuff. Because I'm wanting to teach that literacy stuff. Okay, so, so trust. What about autonomy? The, the sense of uh, exploring. Okay, some people just naturally are more exploratory than others. So don't try to push everybody too far that way. But help people learn to do a little bit of exploring. To step outside their comfort zone. They need to develop that. And if they haven't learned it, from two to three, then teach it to them when they get to school. I love it when some little kid says to me, when I say, so, do you want to ride a bicycle? And they go, uh, I can't ride a bicycle. I said, what you mean is no one's ever taught you how to ride one. I have a special bicycle that I've made just for teaching kids how to ride a bicycle. It's a little short one, so you can sit on it and your feet will touch the ground. Mm -hmm. You want to try it? I don't know. Okay, you want to watch somebody else ride it and see what happens when they're on it? Okay. I mean, see, it's like I'm going to warm them up to the idea. I have somebody who knows how to ride a bike. I said, hey, get on this bicycle. It doesn't have any pedals on it. That's my bicycle for kids who don't know how to ride. Get on this bicycle that doesn't have pedals on it and, and show them how it works. And they get on it and they put their feet on the ground. They start pushing themselves around. See, if the pedals are there, they hit your feet. So I took the pedals off, so it's a nice, straight, easy thing to the ground. So all you do is use your feet to push you around, 
And I go, so you want to try it? And they go, yeah. And they get on there and their feet touch the ground so there's no way to fall down. Then they start walking around and pretty soon they push themselves a little bit and it rolls and they pull their feet up and they go, this is kind of cool. And I say, hey, see that driveway over there? See how it kind of goes downhill? You want to try it? Now, if it goes too fast, just roll up in the grass and you can stop it. And once, and it doesn't take long at all before they're going, woo, this is cool. And they're riding down the hill and bouncing over the curb and around the cul-de-sac and coming back and then walking it back up to the house. And it won't take more than a few hours before the little chipper will say to me, can you put the wheel, can you put the pedals on this bicycle? I'm going, yep, I got them in the garage. And I go get them and I screw them in the little holes and they put their feet on the pedals and they're on their way. I mean, you understand? Whatever it is you're trying to teach the kid, you just back it up to where they can feel comfortable and safe doing it. Did any of you learn to ride a bicycle by they just put you on it and pushed you and you fell over and skinned your knee and said, I don't think I want to ride bicycles. This is stupid. This is too dangerous. I mean, it's just like find a safe way to help children develop this sense that I can do this thing. And, and once you develop some autonomy, then that leads to where you're willing to take more initiative. And when I have a kid who doesn't want to take initiative, I'm thinking probably because they took it in the past and they got scolded for it, they messed up and got in trouble. So I'm going to make sure they don't get in trouble. Any of you remember giving a piece of a picture and some crayons and said, color the picture? And so you just grabbed the crayon and you went, shh, the head, the head's going to be purple. So you just went, shh, all over the paper where from the neck on up. And someone walked up to you and said, you didn't stay in the lines. I thought you told me to color the picture. Well, that's the wrong way to color a picture. I'm telling you, there ought to be attached to the crayon box a switch for the adults who mess with little kids who are just having fun coloring. The little kid's having fun coloring. We tell him he did it the wrong way. How can you color the wrong way? We squander creativity from a very young age. Don't we? We really do. And you say, yeah, but he's coloring all over the page. He's not staying in the lines. If staying in the lines is important, watch this. What can I do with this little paper after he's colored the head purple? And then he colors the body some other color. I get the scissors and I cut out where he colored it and then paste it on a piece of white paper. And his purple is right inside the lines perfectly. It's just a matter of saying, let's figure out a way to do this so we don't so we don't stifle these little children, so we don't wear them out, so we don't steal from them some of the initiative that they ought to have. And of course, then that leads to being industrious. Where, uh, they're in, in fact, these little kids who are making this fudge, I can't wait to get down there, and I'm not going to eat very much of that fudge, but that's not the point. I'm going to take some money and I'm going to buy fudge from every little kid there. And then I don't know what I'll do with it. I'll give it away or throw it away or something. Bring Maybe it to if class. I'll bring it to class. Yeah, you guys will eat it. Okay. I'll tell my <laughs> wife that she can't have it. I'm taking it to class. And then she'll say, but I want some of it. I'll say, Nina, you're diabetic. <laughs> you believe that? I'm at the store buying fruit snacks and they say fruit snacks I say yeah it's for my diabetic wife she just likes sweet stuff she's going to like it till she dies <laughs> I have cholesterol problems I eat biscuits and gravy that's not healthy I know it isn't but it's good so, <laughs> I eat it well. so I'm not going to take her candy away from her so learn to be industrious learn to try things <laughs> my, my poor wife when we got married See, at my house, this was so sad. At my house, my dad said, boys, there's no way one woman's going to cook for four men. That was my dad and our three brothers. So he said, you three boys are going to help. Hmm. So every week, one of us cleaned the house, the other one did the laundry, and the third one helped in the kitchen and didn't help with the grocery shopping. Huh. So I learned all about cooking. That's awesome. So when I got married... My wife had a mother who said, don't come in the kitchen. It just makes me nervous. Just stay out of the kitchen. So she did. Mm. So we get married, and she's trying to cook this delicious meal. And she's in the kitchen, and she's crying a little bit. I said, what's wrong, Nina? She said, I can't make the gravy work. I said, well, here, I'll do it. 
And so I got some flour and shook some water with it and poured it in the pan and browned it and poured milk in it. And I said, there you go. Aww. And she cried more than when she was trying to make the gravy. What's that all about? Does <laughs> <laughs> anybody know what that's all about? She wanted to be able to do it for you and then she had to accept it. And here, here's exactly what she said. I'll never forget. She goes, I'm the one who's supposed to know how to do that. Mm -hmm. I said, when I was in high school, if any of my friends found out I could do that and told people about it, I'd beat them up. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have any choice about it. My dad said, you have to learn how to cook <laughs> to help your poor mother in the kitchen. That's awesome, though. And that didn't help either. She said, I'm still supposed to do it. I said, no. I said, you know what? Gravy's not good for you anyway. Why don't we just forget about making gravy and put butter on our potatoes? And then buy sour cream. And I changed the way I eat potatoes just because. And her mother didn't teach her that stuff. You know what's so cool now after all these years? She has finally realized. I mean, she can, she can make a stew like I said, if we canned this and put it in the store, we'd be rich. That's how good it is. She makes this marvelous stuff. And she just puts stuff together and keeps mixing it till she likes the way it tastes. It's amazing what this lady can do. And, and she didn't learn this from her mother. I mean, I'm glad she didn't learn from her mother. I've been to her mother's house to eat. She pours a can of vegetables in a saucepan, and then she takes oil and goes, bloop, 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 bloop. Oh my. Everything in her house swims in grease. Yeah. And my wife just had to learn from scratch and I said, just try what you like and what you don't like, what doesn't work for you, we just won't eat. We'll find something else to eat. It's just food, fuel and the, the motor. Let's just let it go. And she has, she's the most industrious cook I've ever seen. She can, I mean, she could take anything and make a meal out of it. It's just amazing what this lady can do. And by the way, that, does that contribute to her sense of identity as to who she is? Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. And uh, it enhances our intimacy. I'm married to the best cook in the world. Well, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> is she married to the best cook in the world, Dr. Brother? Because sometimes, Nani, your daughter and your granddaughter make better raisin cookies than you do. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't say that very often. That is not the kind of thing that you go around saying very often. Okay, and then generativity, where you basically get to the place, actually, where you start uh, teaching others to carry on life the way someone helped you learn to carry it on, and then you get old and uh, just reminisce about how much fun it was or what a failure it was. Okay, so help those little kids learn to trust, learn to be autonomous, learn to take initiative, and learn to be industrious. And I'll see you on... Friday. And I'm going to see if I can get a battery and fix that clock. Oh. 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 Oh.